Army of the Potomac, army of brave men. You are to have the victory in the end, but these bleak months are your anguish. Your voice dies out. Let us hear the voice of your steadfast enemy. Army of Northern Virginia, fabulous army, strange army of ragged individualists, the lazy scorners, the rebels against the wheels, the rebels against the steel combustion chamber of the half-born new age, army of planter sons, where a scholar turned the leaves of an Arabic grammar by the campfire glow, and a drawling mountaineer told dirty stories old as the bawdy world, sentimental army, Touched by all lace paper valentines of sentiment. Touched by women and your tradition idea of them. The old book fed, half queen, half servant idea. Starving army. What do your dim, faint voices say? Will we ever get home? Will we ever lick them for good? We've got to go on and fight till we lick them for good. They've got the guns and the money and lots more men. Most of us never own slaves and never expect to. But we won't lie down and let the North walk over us about slaves or anything else. We don't know how it started, but they've invaded us now and we're bound to fight. Till every last man the Yankee goes home and quits. We haven't got guns that shoot as well as their guns. We can't get clothes that wear as well as their clothes. But we've got to keep on till they're licked and we're independent. It's the only thing we can do. We've got the right man to lead us. Army of Northern Virginia... Army of legend, who was your captain that you could trust him so surely? Call Robert E. Lee out of the mist and watch him ride. Comes Traveler and his master. Look at them well. The horse is an iron gray, 16 hands high. Short back, deep chest, strong haunch, flat legs, small head, delicate ear, quick eye, black mane and tail, wise brain, obedient mouth. Such horses are the jewels of the horseman's hands and thighs. The rider now. He too is iron gray, but the thick hair and thick, blunt-pointed beard have frost in them. broad forehead, deep-eyed, straight-nosed, sweet mouth, firm-lipped, head cleanly set. He and his horse are matches for the strong grace of proportion that inhabits both. And so we get the marble man again, the head on the Greek coin, Idle image, worship, uncomprehended and aloof, a figure lost to flesh. How to humanize that solitary gentleness and strength hidden behind the deadly oratory of 20,000 Lee Memorial Days? The man was loved, the man was idolized, the man had every just and noble gift. He took great burdens and he bore them well, believed and followed duty first and last was a great victor, in defeat as great, did not seek intimates, yet drew men to him, did not seek fame, did not protest against it, a Greek proportion and a riddle unread. He kept his heart a secret to the end from all the picklocks of biographers. He was the prop and pillar of a state, the incarnation of a national dream. And when the state fell and the dream dissolved, he must have lived with bitterness itself. He will not tell us. He remains beyond our stagecraft, reticent as ice. This man who murmured, it is well that war should be so terrible. If it were not, we might become too fond of it. And again he said a curious thing to life. I'm always wanting something. The brief phrase slides past us. But for a second there, the marble cracked. And a strange man we never saw before showed us the face he never showed the world and wanted something. Picklock biographers, what could he want that he had never had? It was not God or love or mortal fame. It was not anything he left undone. What does proportion want that it can lack? He only said it once. The marble closed. There was a man enclosed within that image. He wanted something. That must be enough. Now he rides Traveler back into the mist. Jack Elliott, in prison deep in the south, lay on his back and stared at the flies on the wall and tried to remember through an indifferent mist 
a green place lost in the wood and a herd of black swine. They came and went. The two Michigan men had died last night. The Ohio brothers were going to die this week. You got pretty soon so you knew when people would die. But it was only the mist and counting the flies that bothered him. He heard a footstep near him and turned his head. Hello, Charlie, he said. Where have you been? Bailey's face looked strange. The red, hot face of a hurt and angry boy. Out here in the revs, he said. He spat on the floor. Hell, Bailey said. They cheered. They licked us again. The news just come. It happened back at Bull Run. Hey, you're crazy, said Elliot. That was the start of the war. I was in that one. Oh, don't be a fool, said Bailey. They licked us again, I tell you. The same old place. John Brown lies dead in his grave and does not stir. The South goes ever forward. The slave is not free. John Brown's body lies a mole in the grave. Soon the fight will be over. Slaves will be slaves forever. John Brown's body lies a mole in the grave. Arise, John Brown. Call up the clumsy country boys you armed with pikes and a fantastic mind. This is the dark hour. This is the ebb tide. Find your heart, John Brown. A mole in the grave. Call your sons and get your pikes. A mole in the grave. Your song goes on, but the slave is still a slave. Rise up, John Brown. A mole in the grave. Go in Washington that September. Hot in the city, hot in the White House rooms. Women in houses take their corsets off and stifle in loose gowns. They could lie down, but when they touch the bed, the bed feels hot. Sometimes they pause and push a window up to feel the blunt, dry buffet of the heat strike in the face and hear the locust cry of shrilling newsboy voices down the street. News from the Army! It was a little cooler three miles out where the tall trees shaded the soldiers' home. The lank man, Abraham Lincoln, found it so, glad for it, doubtless, though his cavernous eyes had stared all day into a distant fog, trying to pierce it. General McClellan is now in touch with Lee in front of Sharpsburg and will attack as soon as the fog clears. I wish we'd get some news. Bull run the seven days, bull run again, and 18 months of war and still no end to it. What is God's will? They come to me and talk about God's will in righteous deputations and platoons, day after day, laymen and ministers. God's will is general, isn't senator that. God's will is old poor colored fellas' will. It is the will of the Chicago churches. And all of them are sure they know God's will. I am the only man who does not know it. And yet, if it is probable that God should and so very clearly state his will to others on a point of my own duty, it might be thought he would reveal it me directly. More especially as I so earnestly desire to know his will. I mean to save the Union if I can, and by whatever means my hands can find under the Constitution. If God reads the hearts of men as clearly as he must, then he can read in mind that old, scarred wish that the last slave should be forever free here in this country. I do not go back from that scarred wish and have not. But I put the Union first and last before the slaves. If freeing slaves will bring the Union back, then I will free them. If by freeing some and leaving some enslaved, I help my cause, I will do that. 
But should such freedom mean the wreckage of the union that I serve, I would not free a slave. O oh, will of God, I am a patient man and I can wait. That is my only virtue as I see it, ability to wait and hold my own and keep my own resolves once they are made in spite of what the smarter people say. I can't be smart the way that they are smart. I've known that since I was an ugly child. It teaches you to be an ugly child. We've come a good long way, my hat and I. Years of law business, years of cracking jokes, years of trying how to learn to handle men and how to deal with women or a woman. And that's about the hardest task I know. She'll run like mercury between your hands. I understand the uses of the earth, and I have burnt my hands at certain fires often enough to know a use for fire. But when the genius of the water moves, and that's the woman genius, I'm at sea with nothing but old patience for my chart. And patience doesn't always please a woman. Earth, fire, and water. I've passed through them all. Three elements. I have not sought the fourth deeply till now. The element of air. The everlasting element of God. I've never found a church that I could join, although I've prayed in churches in my time. The thing behind the words, it's hard to find. I used to think it wasn't there at all. Couldn't be there. I cannot say that now. And now I pray to you and you alone. Teach me to know your will. There was a man I knew near Pigeon Creek who kept a kennel full of hunting dogs. He'd sell the young ones every now and then, but the one dog he'd never sell or lend was an old half-deaf, foolish-looking hound you wouldn't think had sense to scratch a flea, unless the flea were old and sickly, too. Folks used to plague that man about the dog, and he'd agree with everything they'd say. No, he ain't much on looks, sir, much on speed, but mister. That dog's hell on a cold scent. I am that deaf old hunting dog, oh Lord. I will keep on because I must keep on until you utterly reveal yourself and sink my teeth in justice sooner or late. I should have run the course with younger legs. This hunting ground is stiff enough to pull the metal heart out of a dog of steel. You could have made a better-looking dog with the same raw materials, no doubt, but since you didn't, this'll have to do. Therefore, I utterly lift up my hands to you and here and now beseech your aid. For now, I stand and tremble on the last edge of the last blue cliff, a hound beat out. I can't go on. Yet I, I must go on. I will say this. Two months ago, I read my proclamation setting these men free to Seward and the rest. Then Seward said something I hadn't thought of. I approve the proclamation, but if issued now with our defeats in everybody's mouth, it might be viewed as a last shriek for help from a beaten and exhausted government. Put it aside until a victory comes, then issue it with victory. He was right. I put the thing aside. And ever since there has been nothing for us but defeat until this battle now. And still no news. But I make a promise now to you and to myself. If this last battle is a victory, my proclamation shall go out at last to set these other prisoners and slaves from this next year then and forever free. So much for my will. Show me what is yours. Footsteps in the hall. Good news, or else they wouldn't come so fast. Yeah? 
What is it now? Yes, I'm glad of that. I'm very glad. There's no mistake this time. We have the best of them. They're in retreat. This is a great day, Stanton. If McClellan can only follow up the victory now. Lord, I will keep my promise and go on. Your will in much still being dark to me. I cannot read it, but I will go on, almighty God. At best, we never seem to know you wholly, but there's something left, a strange, last courage. We can fail and fail, but deep against the failure, something wars, something goes forward, something lights a match, something gets up from Sangamon County ground, armed with a bitten and a blunted axe, and after 20,000 wasted strokes, brings the tall hemlock crashing to the ground. walked in the woods that autumn and heard the dry leaves crackle under her feet, feeling below the leaves the blunt, heavy earth. She walked on further and came to the lip of the spring. The brown leaves drifted the water. She watched them drift. I'm satisfied, she thought. I'm satisfied. In spite of Pop looking fierce when he sees me walk so heavy, and knows I'll have to walk heavier still before my time comes. I'm sorry to make him sad. I'm sorry I did a bad thing, if it was a bad thing. But I'm satisfied. Love came by from the river small. When the leaves were fresh on the tree. But I cut my heart on the black jack before they fell on me. The leaves are green in the early spring. They are brown as flimsy. I did not ask for a wedding ring from the wind in the bending
Slow carts hitched along toward the place of exchange through a bleak wind. It was not a long wagon train. Wagons and horses were too important to waste on prisoners for exchange if the men could march. Many did march, and some few died on the way. But more died up in the wagons, which was not odd. If a man was too sick to walk, he was pretty sick. They'd been two days on the road. Jack Elliott lay between a perishing giant from Illinois out by the lakes and a slight tubercular Jew. Bailey marched. He was still able to march. They got to the river at last. Jack Elliott saw a yellow stream and slow boats crossing the stream. Bailey had helped him out. He was walking now. His arm around Bailey's neck, their course was a crab's. The wind blew. They stared across the river and saw the flag. And the tall blue soldiers walking in thick, warm coats, like big, strong men who fed well. And then they cheered. It was a dry, thin cheer, pumped up from exhausted lungs. And then they heard the echo of their own cheer. But it did not end like an echo. It gathered and rose. It was the Confederate sick on the other side cheering their own. The two weak crowd voices met in one piping, gull like cry. Then the boats began to take the weak men on board. In the midst of the stream, they passed a boat with Confederate prisoners so near the men could yell at each other. watched the boat move away. They look pretty bad, he said. They look glad to get back. Ah, they ain't such bad rebs at that. Their boat's nose touched the wharf. It swung and was held. They got out. They didn't move toward the camp at first. They stared back at the river first and the other side without saying word. They stood there thus for a space like a a row of tattered cranes at the edge of a stream, blinking at something. All right, you men, said an officer. Come along. Jack Elliott's heart made a sudden lump in his chest. It was a blue officer. They were back in their lines, back out of prison. Hell, said Bailey, and burst into horrible tears. Jack Elliott held him. A cudgel breathed on the silver urn and rubbed till his hands began to burn with his hoarded scrap of chamois skin. The metal glittered like bright new tin, and yet as he labored, his mouth was sad. Times is getting all mighty bad. 
Christmas coming show and swift, but no use hollering Christmas gift. No use keeping this silver fitting, no use doing nothing but sitting. Gray hairs and Miss Mary's brush, a who and wind in the bay bush. That young red set of done eater pups, we was washing the tea set and bust two cups, just come apart and lies his ham. Christmas, where you gwine to, man? They's took in the carpets and the window weights to go and shoot at the Yankee states. They's took a Nellie, the cross-eyed mule. Whoever took her was one big fool. They's took in this and they's took in that till I can't make up what they're driving at. The hands stopped rubbing, the spoons were shined. He put them back in the flannel bag and stared at his scrap of chamois rag. Melora was tired out. She saw only a lamp and hand. The pains came hard now. The fist had hardly opened before it shut. Oh, a red stare mounting into an ultimate flurry of misty conflict. And it seemed as if she fought against the earth itself for mere breath. And something other than mere breath. She heard the roar of the tunnel drowned in earth. Earth and its expulsive waters tearing her. Being born. Then it was yellow silence and the weak crying. After the child was washed, they showed her the child. Breakable, crumpled, breathing, swathed and indignant with all its nails and with hands that moved of themselves. She looked at the child as if she wanted to tell it. You aren't respectable. What are you doing here? But the child began wailing. She rocked it mechanically. Gettysburg, the beaten Union brigades recoiled from the crossroads town they tried to hold, and so recoiling, rest on a destined ground. You took a carriage to that battlefield. Now, I suppose you take a motor bus. The carriage smelt of axle grease and leather, and the old horse nodded a sleepy head adorned with a straw hat, his ears stuck through it. It was the middle of hay fever summer, and it was hot. And you could stand and look all the way down from Cemetery Ridge, much as it was, except for monuments and startling groups of monumental men. So peaceable it was, so calm and hot, where the bronze open book could still be read by visitors and sparrows and the wind. And the wind came. The wind moved in the grass, saying, while the long light and all so calm. The south came, and the end came. And the grass comes, and the wind blows on the bronze book, on the Now see instead three miles of living men, three long double miles of men and guns and horses and fires and wagons, three double miles of live men, a hundred and sixty thousand 
breathing men. At night, on two hostile ridges set down. It was nine o'clock that morning when the firing began, but it was three before the attacks were launched. They say the bluecoats, marching through the ripe wheat, made a blue and yellow picture that men remember even now in their age, in their crack-voiced age. They say the noise was incessant as the sound of all wolves howling when that attack came on. They say when the guns all spoke, the solid ground of the rocky ridges trembled like a sick child. And so the storm came on. The men who fought there were the tried fighters, the hammered, the weather-beaten, the very hard-dying men. They came and died. They came again and died. They stood there and died. The crest is three times taken and retaken in fierce wolf flurries of combat, in gasping iliads too obscure to freeze in a song. But at last, when the round sun dropped and that last attack came with its cry, Jack Elliott saw it come on. They'd been waiting for hours on that hard hill, sometimes under fire, sometimes untroubled by shells. A man chewed a stalk of grass and hummed to himself. Another played mumbly pig with a worn black knife. Two men were talking girls till they got too mad and the sergeant stopped them. Then they waited again. Jack Elliott waited, hearing that other roar rise and fall, be distant and then approach. Now and then he turned on his side and looked at the sky, as if to build a house of peace from that blue. But he could find no house of peace there, only the roar and the slow sun sinking. He was lying behind a tree. The shelling burst out from the southern guns again. Their own batteries answered. The man with the old black knife shut up his knife and began to baby his rifle. They're coming, Jack thought. This is it, this is it. He felt the old familiar tightness around his chest. The man with the grass chewed his stalk a little too hard and then suddenly spat it out. Jack Elliott saw through the falling night that slight gray fringe that was war. Not as it came in pictures with a ruler edge, but a crinkled and smudgy line like a child's vague scrawl in soft crayon. But moving on. But with little red handkerchiefs of flags sagging up and down here and there. It was still quite far. It was still like a toy attack. It was larger with larger flags. Their own guns on the crest were trying to break it up, but it still kept on. One fringe... And another fringe, and another. He lost them all for a moment in a dip of ground. This is it, he thought with a parched mind. It's a big one. They must be yelling all right, though you can't hear them. They're going to do it this time. Do it or bust. You can tell by the way they come. I hope to Christ the batteries do their job when they get out of that dip. Hell, they've lost them now, and they're still coming. He heard a thin gnat shrieking. <laughs> The new lieutenant, the new lieutenant looked thin. Ah, go home, he muttered. We're no militia. What do you think we are? He was yelling now. He saw a red battle flag push through smoke like a prow and be blotted out by smoke and flash. His heart knocked hard in his chest. Do it or bust, he mumbled, holding his fire while the rags of smoke blew off. He heard a thick chunk beside him. He turned his head for a flicker of time. The man who had chewed on the grass was injuredly trying to rise on his knees, his face annoyed by a smile. Then blood poured over the smile and he crumpled up. Elliot stretched out a hand to touch him and felt the hand rasped by a file. He jerked back the hand and sucked it. Bastards, he said. All this had occurred, it seemed, in no time at all. But when he looked back, that smoky slope of the hill was gray. And that staggering red advancing flag. And those same shouting strangers he knew so well. No longer ants, but there, and stumblingly running. And that high, shrill, hated keen, piercing all the flat thunder. His lips went back. He felt something swell in his chest like a huge and docile bubble. By God, he said, loading and firing, you're not going to get this hill. You're not going to get this hill. By God, you're not. He saw one gray man spin like a crazy dancer and another fall at his heels. But the hill kept growing them. Something made him look to his left. A yellow fanged face was aiming a pistol over a chunk of rock. He fired and the face went down like a broken pipe while something hit him sharply and took his breath. Get back there, you suckers, he croaked. Get back there, you suckers. 
He wouldn't have time to load now. They were too near. He was up and screaming. He swung his gun like a club through a twilight full of bright stabbing and felt it crash on a thing that broke. He had no breath anymore. He was down in the grass. For an instant, that wheel of combat. For an instant, a brief, hard-breathing hush. And then, the hard sound of a column tramping. Blue reinforcements at last. A doomsday sound for the gray. Lee, a mile away in the shade of a little wood, stared with his mouth shut down and saw them go and be slain. Then saw for a single moment the blue Virginia flag planted atop the crest beside that other flag that he knew. The two flags planted together one instant like hostile flowers. Then the smoke wrapped both in a mantle, and when it had blown away, the valley was gray with the fallen and the wreck of the broken wave. Wingate. Wake from a bloodshot dream. They were touching his leg, and he heard his scream. Then a blue-chinned man said a word or two. Now, now, Johnny, you ought to doodle the sawbones comes with his moving van. You're lucky you're living, little man. But why the hell did you act so strict fighting like that when you know you're licked? And where's the rest of your damn brigade? The voice died out as the ripples fade. Army of Northern Virginia, haggard and tattered, tramping back on the pikes through the dust-white summer with your wounds still fresh, your burden of prisoners, your burden of sick and wounded. One long groan of human anguish, six miles long. The night had fallen on the narrow tent. The army was asleep as armies sleep. War lying on a casual sheaf of peace for a brief moment, and yet with armor on. The aide-de-camp knew certain lines of Greek and other such unnecessary things as birds and music that are good for peace but are not deemed so serviceable for war. He saw imprinted on the tent a hollowed jack-o'-lantern, the sharp black shadow of a seated man. A profile like the profile on a bust. Lee in his tent. Alone. I'd know that face among a million faces, thought the still watcher. And yet the hair and beard have quite turned white. Dogwood bloom. I saw him in the wilderness that day when he began to lead the charge himself and the men wouldn't let him. Gordon spoke, and then the men themselves began to yell, Lee to the rear! General Lee to the rear! I'll hear that all my life. I'll see those paws grabbing a traveler in the bridle rein and forcing that calm image back from death. I reckon that's what we think of you, Mars Roberts. It doesn't seem as if a cause could lose when it's believed in by a man like that. And yet we're losing, and he knows it all. No, he won't ever say it, but he knows. I'd feel more comfortable if he'd move. What keeps us going on? I wish I knew... Perhaps you see a man like that go on, and then you have to follow. There can't be so many men that men have followed, so... If he's grown old, it isn't like a man. It's more the way a river might grow old. The sharp-cut profile moved a fraction now. The aide-de-camp went forward on his errand. Melora clucked to a scurvy rack of bones between the shafts. The rickety cart moved on. Melora and her father and her child. The heart-faced girl with enormous eyes, roving from little town to little town, still looking for her soldier. Sherman's 
So Sherman goes from Atlanta to the sea, through the red earth heart of the land, through the pine smoke haze. Strange march, half war, half trooping picnic parade, cutting a ruinous swathe through the red earth land. March of the hardy bummers and coffee coolers, who having been told to forage, loot as they can, and leave a wound that rankles for 60 years. And everywhere a black earth stirs, a wind blows over black earth, a wind blows into black faces, into old hands knotted with long rheumatics, cramped on the hole, into old backs bent double over the cotton. The wind of freedom, the wind of the jubilo. Oh, it don't matter if he's black or tan, jubilo, jubilo. It don't matter if he's black or tan, when you hear the noise of the freedom band, you snatch ball, head to the promised land, it's the year of jubilo. They stray from the lost plantations like children stray, grinning and singing, following the blue soldiers. An old gray field hand dimly plods through the mud, looking for some vague place he has heard of where Lincoln sits at a desk in his gold silk hat with a bag of silver dollars in either hand for every old gray field hand who comes to him. Some stay on the plantations but will not work, sing idly, gamble, sleep through the lazy hours. Others, faithful beyond the bond they never signed, Hold to that bond in ruin as in the sun. Steal food for a hungry mistress. Keep her alive. Every dark is gonna hold a mule. Jubilee, jubilee. Every dark is gonna hold a mule. And left like Adam in the golden rule. And send me chilling to the white folks who feel the blue. Kajo buried the silverware on a graveyard night of sultry air. While the turned sod smelled of the winter damp, and Mary Lou Wingate held the lamp. He was finished at length. He shook his head. Mr. Dreck, we done, he said. They looked at each other, black and white, for a slow-paced moment across the light. Then he took the lamp, and she smoothed her shawl. And he lit her back to the plundered hall to pray with her old serene observance for the mercy of God upon faithful servants and the justice striking all Yankees dead on her cold, worn knees by the great carved bed where she'd lain by gentleman's side, wife and mother and newcomb bride. She struck her hand on the bedstead head. They won't drive me from my house! The wood rang under her wedding ring. Then she stood for a moment, listening. Shout Thanksgiving and shout it loud. Jubilee, jubilee. Shout Thanksgiving and shout it loud. He was dead and buried in the land. But the Lord came down in a glory cloud and he gave us jubilee. Bailey, tramping along with Sherman's bummers, Grumbled and found life pleasant and hummed his tune. He was well, the blood ran in him, he ate for ten. This was pretty soft, this was war the way it ought to be. He was a sergeant now, and up in his pack were souvenirs for that red-haired widow in Cairo. Some of them bought, some just sort of picked up, but not a damned one stolen to call it stealing. He mused a moment thinking of Elliot now. There was another kid and a crazy kid. Hope he finds that girl he was talking about. Sounds like a pretty good piece for a storm and strife. His heart was overflowing with charity, but his throat was dry as the bottom of his canteen, and there was a big white house some way from the road. So he found his captain, saluted, and put his question. The captain's eyes were satiric, but not displeased. All right, Sergeant. Take your detail and forage. So, Bailey came to the door of Wingate Hall with a high wind blowing against him and gave his orders. Clark, you and Ellis stay right here by the door. He knocked and called. There was a long, heavy silence. Hey, you! The house! Silence made him feel queer. He cursed impatiently and pushed at the door. It swung wide open. 
Ellis watched him with mocking eyes. I wish they'd make me a Sergeant Clark, a three-striped souvenir sergeant. Bailey, meanwhile, was roving like a lost soul through great empty rooms and staring at various objects that caught his eye. <laughs> Funny old boy in a wig hung up on the wall. Queer sort of chairs. Made your hands feel dirty just to touch them, though they were faded. Everything faded and old and quiet and the wind blowing. He moved us on tiptoe, though he couldn't say why he did. Oh, old work basket there. He opened it idly. Most of the things were gone, but there was a pair of little gold-mounted scissors made like a bird with the blades, the beak of the bird. He picked up the scissors and opened and shut the blades. And sort of handsome and queer. Bessie'd certainly like this. Wouldn't take up much room. He gazed at the thing. Hadn't rusted either. Then he frowned at it. Ah, hell, he said, I got enough souvenirs. I ain't no damn coffee cooler. He started to put the scissors back in the case and turned to face a slight gray-haired woman. Dressed in black with eyes that burned through his skin and a voice that cut at his mind like a rawhide whip, calling him 50 different kinds of a, 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 a thief and, 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 and Yankee devil and, and, and liar and God knows what, tearing the throat of her dress with her thin old hands and telling him he could shoot her down like a dog, but he'd steal her children's things over her dead body. My God, as if he went around shooting old women for fun, my God. He couldn't even explain, though. She was like all the rest. She made him sick in his lunch. Ah, hell, he yelled. Shut up about your damn scissors. This is a war, old lady. That's right, she said. Curse a helpless female. You big, brave soldier. Oh, what was a man to do? He got out of the house sore and angry, mean as a man could feel. Where the hell was that detail? He saw them now, all except Clark and Ellis, gathered around a white-polled nigger, wringing his hands and weeping. Hey, uncle, where's the well? You folks got a well? But the nigger just kept on crying like an old fool. He thinks we're going to scalp him, said one of the men. I told him twice he's free, but the shine won't listen. I give him some money, too, but he let it drop. Well, tell him he's safe and make him rustle some water. My throat's as dry as a preacher's tongue. Where's Clark and Ellis? He found Clark solemnly prodding the hard dirt floor of a Negro cabin, while Ellis lighted the task with a splinter of burning pine. His rage exploded in boiling lava. They listened respectfully. Well, Sergeant Ellis said, I always heard they buried stuff sometimes under these here cabins, and, well, I thought we could have a look. Well, huh, said Bailey. He seized the torch and stared at the trodden floor for an instant. Then his rage and his pride returned. Hell's fire, he said, flinging the torch aside. Come out of there on the double. Yes, I mean you. They were halfway down the driveway before Ellis spoke. Sergeant, he said, there's something on fire back there. Bailey turned, looked back. The smoke puff climbed in the sky and the wind was high. He hesitated a moment. The cabin probably caught from that burning splinter. Then he set his jaw. Well, suppose that had caught. Damned old, they hurried along. The smoke rose higher behind them. The wind blew the burning flakes on Wingate Hall. Sally Dupre stared out of her bedroom window as she'd stared many times at that clump of trees and saw the smoke rise out of it thick and dark. She looked at the smoke again and her eyes were gray. Then they were black as that smoke. She felt the fire run in her flesh. It's Wingate Hall and it's burning. House that married my lover before he saw me. You are burning. Burning away in a little smoke. Burning the wall between us with your fierce burning. Burning the strife between us with your black flame. Burning down. <laughs> then she caught her breath. We'll have to get the slaves if the slaves will go. I know Bob will. I'm not sure about Ned or Jim. Hurry, Sally. She ran downstairs like the wind. They worked at the hall that night till the dawn came up. Two smoke-stained women, Kudjo and Bob and Ned. When the dawn had risen, the hall was gone. 
Richmond has fallen, the letters are written, the orders given. While stray fighting goes on and gray men and blue men die in odd clumps of ground before the orders can reach them. An aide-de-camp seeks a suitable house for the council from a chance farmer. The first one found is too dirty to please his mind. He picks another. The chiefs and the captains meet. Lee, erect in his best dress uniform, his dress sword hung at his side, his eyes unaltered. Chunky Grant in his mud splash private's gear with the battered stars on his shoulders. They talk a while of Mexico in old days. Then the terms are stated. Lee finds them generous, says so, makes a request. His men will need their horses for the spring plowing. Grant assents at once. Lee walks from the little room. His face is unchanged. It will not change when he dies. The blue men stared at each other for a space of heartbeats, silent. It is over. The room explodes like a bomb. They are laughing and shouting, bearded generals waltzing with one another, everyone talking at once and nobody listening. It's over. It's done. It's finished. Then order again. The gray ghost army falls in for the last time. Marching to stack its arms. There are no cheers or words from blue lines or gray. Only the sound of feet. It is over now. Jack Elliott, an old cudgel in his fist, walked from the town one day of melting ice. Behind him in the town, the spangled flag still fluttered or hung limp for fallen Richmond. He had a picture of Melora's face, dim with long looking at a carried image. He tried to see it now, but it was faint. I hardly knew her. It was years ago. It was such years ago. She must have changed. I know that I have changed. We find such things and lose them and must live in spite of it. Only a fool goes looking for the wind that blew across his heartstrings yesterday. And here he was out walking on a road for no more reason than a crazy yarn just heard about a girl, her father, and a child going through towns and looking for a soldier. The wind burned at his flesh. He let it burn staring at a lost year. So he perceived a slow cart creaking up a slope of hill drawn by a horse as gaunt as poverty and driven by Melora with the child. Sally, waiting at Appleton on an autumn day of clear, bright sun, felt her heart and body begin to burn as she hummed the lesson she had to learn. Mend the broken and patch the frayed and carry your sorrow undismayed when your lover limps in the falling rain, never quite to be whole again. Clear the nettle and plant the corn and keep your body a hunting horn till the new grass grows on the barren plain and the house is built from the dust again. She smiled a little and turned to see a weed-grown path and a scarlet tree <laughs> and Wingate coming there, painfully. Glory, glory, hallelujah, his soul is marching on. John Brown's body lies a-moldering in the grave. Spread over it the blood-stained flag of his song. John Brown is dead, he will not come again. Bury the South together with this man. Bury the bygone South. Bury the minstrel with the honey mouth. Bury the broadsword virtues of the clan, the courtesy and the bitter arrogance. Bury the whip, bury the branding bars, bury the unjust thing that some tamed into mercy being wise, but could not starve the tiger from its eyes. Bury the fiddle music and the dance, the sick magnolias of the false romance. And with these things, Bury the purple dream of the America we have not been. The tropic empire seeking the warm sea. 
the last foray of aristocracy, the great slave-driven bark full oared upon the dark with fetters for the crew and spices for the few, the pomp we never knew. Bury this too. Bury this destiny unmanifest, this system broken underneath the test beside John Brown. Out of his body grows revolving steel. <laughs> Out of his body grows the spinning wheel made up of wheels. The new mechanic birth no longer bound by toil to the unsparing soil or the old furrow line. <laughs> the great metallic beast expanding west and east. His heart a spinning coil, his juices burning oil, his body serpentine. Out of John Brown's strong sinews, the tall skyscrapers grow. Out of his heart, the chanting buildings rise. Rivet and girder, motor and dynamo. Pillar of smoke by day and fire by night. The steel-faced cities reaching at the skies. Genie we have raised to rule the earth, obsequious to our will, but servant master still. Now when the crowd gives tongue, and prophets, old or young, bawl out their strange despair, or fall in worship there, let them applaud the image or condemn, but keep your distance and your soul from them. And while the prophets shudder or adore before the flame, hoping it may give ear. If you at last must have a word to say, say neither in their way it is a deadly magic and accursed, nor it is blessed, but only it is here. 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 